everybody to Cancer Center Grand, Grand Rounds. I'm making a guest appearance today, and I can't say that it's wonderful to be a guest in uh, introducing a very special speaker, uh, who's uh, Dr. Kathy Eng, um, and many of us know Dr. Eng, who is very well known in the field of GI malignancies, and Dr. Eng is the David Johnson Chair in Surgical and Medical Oncology, and she's co-leader of the GI Cancers Research Program at Vanderbilt. She's also, I think, co-director of the, or director of the Young Adults Cancer Initiative and started at Vanderbilt about a couple of years ago, so really has done phenomenally. Um, Kathy received her MD from Hahnemann and then her residency in internal medicine at Rush and then did her fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Chicago. And then sp spent majority of her life at MD Anderson focused on what is close to, I think, several of our hearts in, in focused on colorectal cancers, GI cancers, and translational research and what impact can we do in, in those fields. She also played important roles in faculty governance. I was excited to see Kathy take a role in, uh, as in the faculty senate, which often is an important piece, and then moved to Vanderbilt in 2019. Her interest has been in clinical trials and how can we define novel drugs for treatment of these cancers. And as I mentioned, has also beyond focus on the young adult colorectal cancer patients, has also focused on role of immunotherapy in HPV associated cancers, has published many, many papers on these fields and has led many trials. I'm not gonna enumerate all of the, her leadership roles in the various national societies, the NASCO, ASCO GI, ECOG, NCI. Most recently, Dr. Eng was chosen as the vice chair of the SWOG GI committee and NCI GI steering committee, um, and also has focused on workforce shortages. So overall, um, what I would describe as not only a talented clinician, but also thinking about our field and oncology and the broader things that guide us. So really looking forward to our presentation today. Welcome, Kathy. We're only sorry this is virtual. Well, thank you so much. And let me go ahead and share my screen. And, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, did, did it come across okay? Perfect. So today is March 1st. So it's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So I am delighted. Um, to uh, participate in this session with all of you today and with so many familiar faces. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so we'll just be touching upon um, kind of uh, the general field regarding colorectal cancer since it seems appropriate for March Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And um, these are the topics we'll be discussing. And these are my disclosures. So friendly reminder for those that are, um, don't treat colorectal cancer on a regular basis, um, it, it is expected in 2022 that 151,000 individuals will be diagnosed with this disease and about 45,000 of those will be rectal carcinoma. It still remains the second leading cause of cancer death for men and women combined. And the median age, as many of you are aware, is usually in the late 60s, but I'm gonna be touching upon that because of my own interest in early onset colorectal cancer. And for as long as I've been in practice, um, unfortunately the five-year survival for our stage four patient population has basically only changed from about uh, 13 to 14%. And it looks closer now to 15% based upon these uh, numbers. Friendly reminder as well, um, for the majority of our patients, unfortunately, um, they do not have an inherited form of uh, colorectal cancer, uh, such as Lynch syndrome or FAP, and the majority of cases are going to be sporadic. And that's why um, this is very difficult uh, uh, cancer for us to tackle because I believe it's largely multifactorial. I'm not gonna be touching upon the very basic information regarding chemotherapy because most of the literature nowadays is about um, molecular subsets. And I'll touch upon the more um, recent data on some of those subsets. But for us, for any uh, stage four surgically unresectable patient or a patient that is going to receive neoadjuvant therapy with metastatic disease prior to surgical resection, um, we often consider the use of systemic chemotherapy. And the most common regimens, as many of you are familiar with, may include full FOX or full FURY with the consideration of a targeted agent such as bevacizumab 
or anti-EGFR therapies such as PMAB or cetuximab if the patient is RAS wild type. If the patient's treatment naive, if they don't have a right-sided tumor, we may want to consider anti-EGFR therapy, although that is not my personal preference. I tend to reserve it for uh, further down the line. And then full Fox Erie um, for a patient that is well with good performance status is very reasonable as well with a high response rate of 65 to 78%. And then of course we have our oral agents, uh, regorafenib and Lonserf that are currently FDA approved as single agents in the refractory setting. And then last but not least, the rare subtypes. Currently our median survival for all stage four patients is roughly 32 to 34 months for the general patient population. But once again, right-sided tumors do not appear to fare um, as well in regards to overall survival um, for our uh, either RAS mutant patients and then our right-sided patients. Um, these are the molecular subsets that we've largely been focused on recently. Um, KRAS is the most common mutation for the majority of our patients, but we do like to take into account other rare RAS mutations such as NRAS and HRAS. And then we do have some other rare mutations, including MSI high, which we'll be discussing, the BRAF mutation, which is um, less than 10% of our patient population with B600E. PIK3CA is being investigated as um, in clinical trials. And then, um, and then there's the NTRAC fusion, which I will not be touching upon because that's extremely rare and I have yet to see a patient with the NTRAC fusion. Um, but I'm always curious um, when people tell me they've had one occasional patient and that's less than 1% of all patients. So for all of our patients with metastatic disease, I'm gonna be focusing on that uh, in large part for this talk um, and then touching upon a little bit on early stage colon and rectal if we have time. But next generation sequencing is, is extremely important for our patient population and identifying once again, those mutations that I mentioned. And um, these are some of the aspects we'll be touching upon once again, MSI, RAS, BRAF and HER2 amplification. For MSI high colorectal carcinoma patients, which represent less than 10% of our patient population. Um, this is one of the most important studies to date for our MSI high patients. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the role of um, uh, pembrolizumab in treatment naive MSI high uh, colorectal carcinoma patients. This was basically a one-to-one -one randomization that has since been updated in regards to overall survival compared to standard chemotherapy. And in this case, there was two primary endpoints, PFS and OS. And the results were extremely impressive um, when they were um, originally presented and eventually published. And this is looking at the progression-free survival for our MSI high treatment naive patients when receiving pembrolizumab. This is single agent pembrolizumab. Now you may say that there's a crossover in about a third of patients um, in those that did receive pembrolizumab at first and did not appear to benefit from this drug. And unfortunately we don't have the exact etiology to account for this right now. But as you can see here, the PFS was twice as high for that versus standard chemotherapy for the majority of patients. And the OS has also been determined to be um, of significance in the sense that there was crossover allowed. Once again, this is a co-primary endpoint. So 60% of patients were allowed to cross over to receive IO therapy. And so that, that is obviously an issue when um, looking at your statistical significance. The pre-specified p-value was supposed to be 0 0.0246. So they did not meet um, its pre-specified uh, value for OS. However, obviously I would say um, we can clearly see that there was crossover 60% of the patients and that's likely accounted for this. And also keeping in mind, this is really considered the standard of care for these patients. Now, what is the other one third of patients that do not appear to benefit from IO therapy? Once again, we still have yet to um, uh, understand why that is. And obviously it does bring to mind that is there a potential benefit for the consideration of chemotherapy plus IO therapy, and that is an ongoing trial, by the way. Um, looking at response rate, you can see here 44% versus 33% for pembrolizumab versus standard chemotherapy. But what is of great interest, I think, for many of us is the fact that um, there may be some potential benefit for combination therapy. Now, this is a single arm study, Checkmate 142, looking at NEVO plus IPI. Um, it, was, it was part of um, a large 
uh, study um, that were not comparative arms, but looking at various cohorts. And this was in the treatment naive setting. Here, primary endpoint was response, and this was published by um, uh, Heinz Joseph Lenz uh, last fall. And I told you the response rate was 44% for single agent pembrolizumab. Keeping in mind, this is once again a small study, 45 patients, this is not a phase three. But the response rate was 69%. And as you can see across the board, um, a quite impressive response rates. And they reported that the 24-month um, OS was 79%. So it's actually quite impressive. And obviously, I think many of us look forward to learning more about the benefit of combination therapy and see if it is truly superior. But once again, pembrolizumab has demonstrated this in a phase three trial. What are the ongoing trials? So there is a stage three um, trial um, called Atomic, which is full Fox plus or minus Atezo. And then, as I mentioned before, there is a combo study that was very slow to enrollment. Um, hopefully, we'll, it will finish enrollment at some point called COMMIT, looking at full Fox uh, plus BEV and then Atezo. There is a Merck platform study that is also new and ongoing as well. And in rectal cancer, there's actually some very intriguing data regarding MSI high, and that was just reported, so we'll touch upon that. So obviously the results um, from pembrolizumab were quite impressive. And, and there was another pilot trial called the NICHE trial, looking at a very, very small number of MSI high patients and looking at the role, MSI high and MSI stable patients, looking at the role of neoadjuvant IO therapy in that setting. And they noticed there was some significant benefit. So why not consider that in an MSI high rectal patient population? And this trial was actually just um, presented by Dr. Loomish, who is a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering under the guidance of my friend, Andrea Sursik. They are looking at Dostarlamab. So here, locally advanced MSI high rectal cancer, stage two, stage three, they gave six months of Dostarlamab. And then they wanted to look at basically their um, response by endoscopy as well as by imaging. And the primary endpoint here is response. Now, the results from this trial were so impressive that they decided to go ahead and provide the presentation on the first 11 out of 16 patients enrolled. The total number of patients expected to enroll, um, enroll in this trial is 30 patients. And here's what they call clinical complete response. Once again, is the endoscopic CR plus the radiographic CR, and they required all patients to have an MRI. And this, this was the patient population. Just to give you an idea real quick, I'm just gonna to touch upon the key points. A lot of patients were T3, T4. A lot of patients were node positive. These were MSI high, but all were BRAF uh, wild type. And this is the very early results. We do not have long-term results, just early results of the first 11 patients out of the 16 enrolled thus far. And they reported a complete CR. And in this study, in fact, they omitted the consideration of radiation and surgery. So do keep that in mind um, in this patient population. Obviously, single institution study, we need more follow-up. Um, and I'd like to see this data validated. Now, in full disclosure, um, Kristen Siambor, who I'm helping to mentor, and I've worked with her extensively on this protocol, we had actually um, created this national trial um, supported by ECOG, EA2201, looking at neoadjuvant nevo IPI, also in the MSI high patient population, with the consideration of 5 by 5 radiation therapy, um, and then also the consideration of sphincter preservation. Um, here, primary endpoint is PATH-CR. Because the findings from ASCO-GI from Dr. Loomish, uh, this trial is going to undergo some rapid amendment um, to maybe uh, allow the consideration of not necessarily requiring uh, five by five radiation therapy unless there's bulky tumor um, and adenopathy. And obviously, um, once again, it's very interesting because we had ac actually recommended the consideration of making sphincter preservation as a primary endpoint. But when we originally wrote this trial, um, we were told that that was being too progressive. And here we are today trying to amend this trial to keep up. But once again, this is a national trial and we, it, it will remain open and we hope to enroll these um, patients. Once again, it's a pilot study of roughly 31 patients as well. What about our BRAF mutant patients? Well, for our MSI stable BRAF mutant patients, it's very poor prognostic uh, factor for these patients. Less than 9% of our patient population, unlike melanoma, single agent BRAF inhibitors have not been impressive with a response rate of less than 5%. And we noted that um, there were basically escape mechanisms um, in colorectal cancer in comparison to uh, the success that was seen in melanoma. 
With standard chemotherapy, the median overall survival is only 12 to 14 months. And so what can we do? How can we basically not only uh, utilize our BRAF inhibitors, but how can we also um, consideration other downstream impact? And so here um, we have the combination basically with, with BRAF, EGFR, and then there was an attempt in combination with MEC. This was the beacon trial. So the beacon trial had a triplet versus a doublet uh, versus standard chemotherapy for patients that have received at least one prior line of therapy uh, for um, uh, BRAF mutant V600E mutation. And um, the doublet was determined to be just as successful as the triplet. And this was FDA approved. This is the regimen called BRAF TOVI. Um, and it resulted in an OS of 9.3 months versus standard chemotherapy. Now, what's really interesting is they decided to examine that regimen because it seemed to be the most successful and try to move it up front to the treatment naive setting. And this is the anchor trial, which was reported at ESMO. And I show it here because this has since been updated as well at ESMO last year. And they reported a response rate of about 50%. Um, however, the PFS was only about four months. And so that was clearly not a home run for a treatment naive uh, patient. So at this year's ASCO GI, just a couple of weeks ago, um, Dan Morris, who I'm so very proud of from MD Anderson, uh, has completed uh, this pilot trial at MD Anderson, looking at encarafenib and cetuximab, so the BRAF tovi but in combination with um, immune checkpoint inhibition with nivolumab in this setting. And this is in previously treated patients. And the reason for that is because um, there appears to be a higher immune activation and higher TMB in this patient population. And as you know, some of the BRAF subtypes actually um, are very similar to CMS1. So more likely to respond to IO therapy. Single institution study, small numbers, important to keep in mind. Um, and here's the primary endpoint response. And these were the doses that were provided to these patients. Keeping in mind, these patients need a better option. Um, as I just showed you, they don't do well with standard chemotherapy and even with BRAF um, targeted therapy, um, they still need a, a better response. So once again, single institution, but very thought provoking. Um, they report a response rate 50%. So not much higher than what was already reported in the prior study. However, the PFS was a little bit higher at 7.4 months and the OS was 15.1 months. This is after a median fault time of 16 months. Now these results were impressive enough that um, now this is going to be a national trial swab 2107 with a two to one randomization of the addition of IO therapy um, at a, a study less than 75 patients. This should be opening up, um, this is March. So it should be opening up at the latter part of April. Um, and uh, we are excited about this trial. It allows uh, one to two prior lines of therapy. So that's in your previously treated BRAF patients. If you have any patient uh, starting in the next two months, please consider this trial when it is open and to activate it at your institution. Now there is a phase three trial that is ongoing um, for these patients. And I also want to highlight this because it is the only phase three trial in treatment naive patients. So this is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization of um, basically BRAF tovi so encarafenib, the BRAF inhibitor, plus cetuximab, or that same combination, BRAF tovi plus Fulfox. They've actually decided not to proceed with full fury. That was part of the run-in phase, and so it is now with Fulfox. This phase three arm just opened uh, about two weeks ago. And then the control arm is standard chemotherapy. So this trial is largely being run um, in Europe and there are about nine sites the last time I checked in the United States. We are one of the sites that are participating in this trial. Once again, we really need to find an option for these patients with very poor prognosis otherwise. So please consider enrollment to this trial. I wanted to just briefly touch upon HER2 because um, there's a lot of interest in direct TCAN. I know that many of you are familiar with direct TCAN because it is approved in gastric and breast cancer. But HER2 positivity is extremely rare in colorectal cancer, unlike um, a gastric and breast cancer. It's about 4% of our patients. Um, once again, it is required to be 3 plus by IHC or FISH amplified um, and IHC 2 plus. So ongoing studies that I will not be touching upon because they finished enrollment but have not yet been reported yet. There's SWOG 1613, which is trezituzumab plus pertuzumab versus standard chemotherapy in the previously treated set, uh, setting. And then the Mountaineer study was to catnib plus trezituzumab. 
Now I'll just be touching upon destiny because this was a recently updated as well. So destiny is looking at an antibody drug conjugate, which is directs TCAN. And this trial, it was extremely um, interesting for many of us in colorectal cancer because it's a, number one, it's a different type of drug. And number two, they allowed patients that have had prior anti her therapy. You'll see here, they provided the 6.4 milligram per kilogram dose. And I mentioned that because there's a second study that is also testing the dose currently that is open. And this is at Q3 weeks. You'll see cohort A is your IHC three plus patient population or your fish positive. Cohort B is IHC two plus and then cohort C is IHC one plus. And primary endpoint was response because keeping in mind, these are a small patient population. And here, focusing on cohort A, that's really where your focus should be. 53 patients, of those 53 patients, 24 had a response. And these were heavily pretreated patients. If I recall correctly, the median line of therapies was three. And, um, and basically the response rate was 45%. Um, so once again, it can be provided to a patient that's HER2 positive, that, it's, that is naive to uh, trastuzumab, or it can be provided to a patient that has um, had progression of disease with trez map, and this could be an option. Now, very similar to the studies in breast and gastric, there is a known toxicity, as many of you are aware, with interstitial lung disease, which is in less than 10% of the patient population, but something important to keep in mind. And then I wanted to touch upon KRAS. So KRAS mutation for us in colorectal cancer has been one of the... Um, most common mutations, especially when you take into account your standard KRAS, but then you also have your HRAS and NRAS, which means all these patients do not benefit. So that's about 30 to 60% of patients do not benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. And then recently there's been some interest looking at drugs that are specific to the KRAS G12C mutation. Now, keeping in mind, this is very, very rare in colorectal cancer. It's less than 5% of our patients, but it is a potential option. Now, this has been reported. Um, you pro you've probably seen the data already with lung, much more impressive with lung and colon, not so impressive as a single agent. Basically, the response rate was about a little less than 10%, and this was just published recently. Sotorasib so is the drug. The progression through survival was four months. The median fall was after the after median fall of 11 months. The 12 month PFS was only 11%. Um, now they are obviously looking at this drug in combination. Um, so I, I look forward uh, to seeing some of that data. But I just want to show this, although not specific to colorectal cancer, once again, this is at aggressive um, from another competing company. And I wanted to show this because um, it was very important in regards to pancreatic cancer, once again, the very small numbers. So I always, I'm always very hesitant when I see very early data, but basically to focus on the GI patient population, um, they reported that there was basically a response um, a 10, in 10 patients, five out of those 10 had a response with pancreatic cancer, which is unheard of as many um, can guess, because once again, um, pancreatic cancer is, still remains a challenge and we don't have a lot of novel agents. Um, this is once again G12C, which is not the most common uh, RAS mutation in pancreatic cancer, but once again could be potentially beneficial. And then they are looking at it in other malignancies. Very similar so that, to the soda RAS, they are looking at it in combination as well. So just intriguing data from this year's ASCO GI. Um, I did want to focus on the role of circulating tumor DNA uh, just very briefly because there are two ongoing trials in early stage disease. And then there was this trial that was just presented um, at ASCO GI from the Japanese group, Dr. Katata, called Circulate Japan. And I thought that this was a very, very, um, a very important study that should uh, receive attention um, because it looked at basically all stages of colon, rectal cancer, receptable stage four, um, they basically obtained pre-op uh, circulating tumor DNA using the Signatera platform. And then they followed the patients at four weeks, 12 weeks, 24 and 36 weeks. And so they provided their data regarding the first 1000 plus patients that have been enrolled this far in this trial. And they've compiled it 
um, based upon these three ongoing studies, as you can see here, uh, uh, Vega, Galaxy, and Altair. And what it really shows is basically where we think the field is obviously going. Um, here we have some information for stage one through stage four. And, um, and as you can see here, the disease-free survival, if your circulating tumor and DNA remain negative was dramatically different from if you remained positive. And this is at post-op um, when compared to baseline at four weeks. And then they continued to look at their sequential circulating tumor DNA at four weeks and 12 weeks. And as you can see here, obviously if it remained negative, that's a very positive benefit in regards to disease-free survival. But if you went from negative to positive, that changed your disease-free survival from 98% to 63%. If you went from positive to negative, um, let's say with adjuvant chemotherapy, that improved your disease-free survival, but positive to positive obviously was not a good prognostic indicator. And this is looking at the role of adjuvant chemotherapy here if you have a positive circulating tumor DNA. So very intriguing data and probably the largest data to date. Um, so it's, it's just important to note. And once again, the purpose of this lecture today is kind of give you an idea of the existing interest on in many of the studies that are ongoing in colorectal cancer. So, um, oh, I apologize. I missed, I apologize. But oh, there it is. Okay, I was on the right track. I thought I didn't include the slide. So currently, and as many of you that know me, I'm heavily involved in the NCTN uh, cooperative groups with SWAG and ECOG, and um, especially with my role now on the uh, GI steering committee, I'm very supportive of cooperative group trials. So this is the COBRA trial looking specifically at stage two colon cancer. As many of you know, for stage two colon cancer, as long as I've was in fellowship till now, it's always been a discussion with the patient about the role of adjuvant chemotherapy because it's never been really well defined. and has not been statistically significant thus far um, in any prospective trials. So here, um, can you utilize the role of circulating tumor DNA and take some of this new science, so they're using the GARDEN platform, and apply it? Um, and so this is being led by um, Van Morris, who I mentioned to you earlier is running the BRAF trial, um, looking at patients that are either just going to uh, receive standard of care with active surveillance, or um, they have their circulating tumor DNA. If there's no circulating tumor DNA detected, they just go on standard uh, surveillance. If it is positive, then they will receive full FOX or KPOX. And so this trial is ongoing. So um, if you have uh, stage two plate patients um, with colon carcinoma, please consider enrolling to this trial. There's also the Circulate US study, which will be led by Chris Liu and Arvind Dasari. Once again, um, my very close colleagues, and um, I've had the pleasure of working with them and mentoring them over the years. And um, now uh, they have their own trial as well for stage three patients. And here, um, if your circulating tumor DNA is detected, you would be randomized to full Fox Erie um, versus standard KPOX or full Fox. So this trial should open up any day. It's had a, an amendment even before it was opened. It, that's resulted in a delay at about a year. And other ongoing trials. So in full disclosure, um, I am the uh, uh, one of the national PIs here in the United States for Fresco 2. Um, I just wanted to make sure to keep this on your radar because this trial has completed enrollment. And um, well, hopefully we'll get some information regarding the results at some point soon. Um, so we can determine if there is a benefit from this agent. This is an anti-VEGF um, agent as well. Um, and it was compared to placebo um, in patients that have um, been previously treated with all standard chemotherapy and they may have received regorafenib or Lonserf or the combination, um, or I'm sorry, been exposed to both of them in the past. So it, it allowed all patients um, to participate. And the reason I also wanted to de demonstrate this, show this to you is because it enrolled um, very quickly earlier than the expected timeframe. And that's because it was such an unmet need uh, for our, our pre-treated metastatic colorectal carcinoma patients. There is only one phase three ongoing trial at this time, um, uh, which is an international trial, it's LEAP. Um, it's based upon this very small study of originally 30 patients. They have this small phase two study of 30 patients and they've now expanded it uh, based upon these results. Um, as you can see here, uh, basically 22% with a short PFS of 2.3 months. And they've created this phase three trial that is ongoing. 
looking at levatinib plus pembrolizumab. Um, so um, trying to identify another potential option for patients and then, then patients will be considered um, uh, compared, sorry, to the standard of care of regorafenib or Lonserve. So this is the only ongoing phase three trial currently enrolling, and I'm sure it will also uh, finish enrolling quickly. Um, hope, I believe there's an, um, hopefully another couple of other trials that are um, uh, going to be open soon, um, but currently when I last checked, um, these were the only activated trials. And um, I wanted to touch on rectal cancer because I think it's really important for people to see where the field is going. Um, so traditionally for rectal cancer, we had always provided neoadjuvant chemotherapy with 5-FU-based treatment and then proceeded to um, surgical resection with the TME and then followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, whether it's 5-FU-based or oxaliplatin-based. But the reality was that a uh, fair number of patients were never receiving their adjuvant chemotherapy, either due to delays from surgical resection, due to toxicities or um, wound healing issues, or um, just lack of compliance um, in regards to their adjuvant treatment. So what can we do to change this aspect? And in Europe, um, they just started looking at the sequence. And then in the United States, we have followed suit. And now it's called total neoadjuvant therapy. If you could potentially provide all your treatment, chemotherapy, and your chemo radiation therapy upfront before consideration of surgical resection or the reverse sequence, chemo radiation therapy followed by chemotherapy. But I wanted to touch upon this trial because um, it's important. And, so I do want to mention this. And the other reason um, is that obviously radiation therapy has um, known toxicities. And for our patients, this is obviously an issue that we do want to take into account. So is there a way to reduce our toxicities? And is there a way potentially to even avoid surgical resection? So um, this is Angelita Habragama, who I believe is in her late 80s. Um, at, at, at this point. And when she originally um, published on the consideration of just observing by close surveillance those patients that had had a significant response to their treatment, instead of proceeding with uh, TME, can you watch and wait, basically do a watch and wait approach and watch them conservatively? And when she originally brought up this concept, she herself as a surgeon, people thought she, that this, was, this, was, this could not be possible, this data was not real. Um, why would a surgeon not offer a patient surgical resection with rectal cancer? And in fact, she appears to have caught up, obviously she was way ahead of her time once again um, for this amazing idea. So now we have uh, some very interesting data from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group. They created the OPRA trial. The OPRA trial was a phase two study, and I wanted to emphasize um, this needs to be validated. This was a phase two study done that was completed at select sites, um, I think about 15 to 18 sites in low-lying rectal tumors, providing the patients either chemo radiation therapy followed by chemotherapy or um, induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation therapy. And the patients were evaluated um, by endoscopy and MRI. If they had no complete response, then they went on to um, total mesorectal um, excision, or uh, if they had clinical response, you could undergo a watch and wait approach. And here you can see, regardless of the sequence that you received, um, there was equivalent disease-free survival. But what he also noted was those patients, once again, low-lying tumors, um, stage two or stage three, if you received chemo radiation therapy first, then followed by chemotherapy uh, for systemic therapy, these patients appear to be more likely to have sphincter preservation and were more likely to undergo a watch and wait approach because of their degree of response. Now, this is phase two. Um, it is being um, uh, uh, expanded more, not the exact same way, but it is um, going to be a phase three trial led by Josh Smith, also from Memorial Sloan Kettering, for consideration of this watch and wait approach. And once again, um, we need to validate the data. Now, they did update their data, just so you are aware, um, at uh, last year's ASCO. And here's pictures of clinical complete response, near complete response, and incomplete complete response. And the time frame of which they assessed when the response 
uh, sorry, of the degree of response was roughly seven to eight weeks. And here you can see when looking at organ preservation, obviously those that had a clinical complete response at three years, that was 78% versus a near complete response um, at three years was 45%. Um, so obviously there was um, possible, there's a possibility of a watch and wait approach for some of your patients. Um, whenever we have this opportunity, we review it with both our radiation oncologists, our surgical oncologists, and our medical oncologists, and really make this a multidisciplinary approach and um, discuss it at our multidisciplinary tumor board. And I would obviously encourage everyone else to do the same. So very intriguing. Obviously, we look forward to the phase three trial. And last but not least, I do want to touch upon um, something very dear to me, our early onset colorectal cancer patients. So this data is not new data. This is looking at the SEER database um, from 1975 to 2010. It was originally published by Christina Bailey, who's actually now my colleague here at Vanderbilt. Um, she wrote this when she was a fellow at MD Anderson. And as you can see here, as you can see here, um, there uh, is an expected increase over the next decade for our young patients in blue is 20 to 34 years of age, in red is 35 to 49 years of age. I'm sorry. Somebody has the wrong number, I apologize. Um, and um, rectal cancer also is supposed to be increased um, by the year 2030 by 124% in the very young, the 20 to 34 year age group. This obviously was recognized by patient advocates, um, patients and their providers as well. And this resulted in a change, uh, I think as many of you are aware, um, by the US Preventive Task Force to reduce our screening age from 50 years old to 45 years old. And so this is a new recommendation. Obviously, if the patient is having symptoms um, and it's younger than 45 years of age, we would encourage screening um, immediately. But this is an issue. Um, you can see here trends in the United States looking at 2001 through 2005 versus a decade later on. And you can see there's an increased incidence of young onset colorectal cancer, and especially in those states with um, a higher incidence of, of obesity. This actually has been uh, demonstrated as well in the Nurses' Health Study, looking at your current BMI and your risk of colorectal cancer. And there's also been some interesting data looking at the role of antibiotic use and exposure and how it may impact the microbiome. This is one of, of roughly about three to four studies that have been um, published as of late. So intriguing data. Once again, we don't know um, the exact reason why our young adults who the majority of them have spontaneous colorectal cancer, they do not have Lynch syndrome or developing colorectal cancer at such an early age. So we um, had the honor of, of, of publishing a paper, paper recently in Lancet Oncology, um, looking at how to create a framework for these patients. As many of you know, I've, I've created this young adult cancer center here at our um, institution, which is not just for colorectal cancer patients, it's for all young adult cancer patients between the ages of 20 and 45. And these are some of the aspects you really need to think about when you're seeing these patients, fertility, financial guidance, physical well-being, being, sorry. Um, uh, other concerns, obviously, um, regarding um, job security, um, uh, body image, um, and just the fear of not knowing exactly how best to address this, because these individuals are very young, um, and they're going through a very different aspect of their life versus our older median age patient of 67 years old. In addition, um, we you know, as you can guess, um, these patients face other concerns, especially regarding financial toxicities and, and the, the pressure that they feel um, because um, some of them um, obviously are still working and don't have financial independency, uh, that they're, they're not financially independent, that they don't have to worry about the cost of care. And so these are important things to take into account for our young adult patient population. So here are my co-directors. I just wanted to highlight that Michael Byrne and uh, Libby Davis. Um, Michael Byrne is in BMT and Libby Davis is in sarcoma. And this is just the information on our program. And we're very grateful to have many involved um, in our group and provide resources for our patients. And um, this was actually one of my patients. Uh, she was 32. Um, you know, I love it when people say, well, you look too healthy, you can't have colorectal cancer. Well, she was training for a marathon um, and she was in great health, um, but had bowel issues probably for about eight months. 
Uh, they kept on telling her that she had um, uh, irritable bowel disease or it was hemorrhoids or it's from her marathon training. Um, and when I saw her, um, she had about 50 to 60 percent of her liver involved with tumor. Unfortunately, um, she, as you can see here, um, she fought for, with her, um, basically uh, was amazing um, uh, individual, fought her colorectal cancer, um, and lived with it for about five years, and unfortunately uh, passed away um, uh, the latter part of last year. But during her time, um, she uh, made a huge effort to serve in advocacy groups and became a national patient advocate for the Fight Colorectal Cancer Program. And that was actually a picture of her in Times Square. And she used to run regularly these 5K events um, with her friends, walk friends. So um, in closing points, uh, please remember screening starts at the age of 45. Please continue to educate others about the signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer and recognize that these patients may need to be screened earlier than 45 if they have these symptoms that do not resolve. Recognize the unmet needs, uh, our so psychosocial needs of our patients. Uh, currently, most of the advances in colorectal cancer have largely been made in the rare molecular uh, subtypes. Um, and for the majority of our patients, we still need novel agents. And unfortunately for us in colorectal cancer, IO therapy has had limited efficacy, excluding in MSI high patients. Uh, next generation sequencing is always the standard of care for our patients. And I always, always, always try to enroll to a clinical trial whenever possible. Um, so we can obviously make greater treatment advances. So thank you so much for your attention. And um, I would be happy to take any questions. Kathy, hopefully that was great. Hopefully I didn't um, talk too fast. No, 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 no. It was perfect. And it was incredibly informative and um, really um, just wonderful. Um, I think Nita may have the first question. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and thanks, Eric. I, as Dr. Weiner mentioned, really informative and, and taking us through where the field is. Perhaps my first question to you is more around uh, rectal cancer management. And as you mentioned at the end, uh, the Habergama data and watchful waiting, and I think the early trial on neoadjuvant. I think part of the worry there is, are you, how are you all accounting? And this, you know, is around this field where there's not only a biological implications, but um, quality of life implications. That is, do you miss the window on um, a curative approach without an ostomy. And, and, I, and I wonder if that was considered, especially in that first trial, which I thought was um, interesting that people at Memorial agreed to do that, uh, to put in checkpoint early on, and because you may lose a window. And I wonder where you think the field is on that. And then I have a bigger question perhaps around colon cancer. I, I think because um, number one in rectal cancer, you know, as, as I showed you, the Incidence is expected to be quite high over the next day, decade, especially for our young patients. So from my own personal experience, when I'm seeing these patients, a lot of them are willing to take that risk because especially if they have a low lying tumor, they don't want to consider an APR. Yeah. And so they're willing to consider that risk as long as they're being followed closely. And many of them are extremely compliant then. Yes. Um, in that setting. So I think that in that case, as long as they have a good relationship with their surgical oncologist um, and med medical oncologist, um, I think it's very reasonable to consider it in, in that setting. You know, obviously what I didn't show you is that no one's really looked at the role of circulating tumor DNA in the setting. Right. But in the uh, phase three trial that's, I, I don't know, I presume won't be open for another eight to 10 months. I hope they will also take that into account. And I think other trials are also trying to take that into account. And obviously, cause that could impact our sur surveillance period as well. Um, but I agree with you, you know, recurrent rectal cancer is one of the most challenging cancers because of the quality of life on patients, because uh, law, uh, uh, largely the involvement of the sacrum when they have recurrent disease and the pain that may ensue. Um, but I, I it's very interesting when you talk to the national patient advocacy groups, you know, once again, a large number of them are younger patients. They are more than willing to take that risk um, to avoid the potential issues with bowel, bowel issues, to avoid even radiation therapy in the setting of the MSI high patient population because of toxicities as well. 
so they're really looking at quality of life the majority of them no i right. think for the ones that are low and you can avoid a stoma they'll do it i think the ones where the worry is is it's perhaps an lar and now you're dooming them to a recurrence and eric yeah. will remember this in the late 90s we were doing local excisions for t2 t3 and then they were coming back with a apr so i think that that perhaps is the part that i think would be a concern. And I think Brazilian data, they follow their patients really closely, whereas we're not as, as a coordinated system in America. They do. And, and you have a very valid point, but but patients are really uh, motivated. Can I ask just a little question before you get to your big question, Nita? Um, mm -hmm. And my little question is, how do you, you know, so I, I understand you follow people closely, but how do you follow people closely? I mean, you can't you can't be biopsying multiple little areas all the time. So you're following people closely with just um, you know uh, some sort yeah. of scoping, you know, a low Correct. scoping procedure. Correct. We've kind of followed at our institution. We've kind of followed the memorial um, uh, data and have also done the regular intervals with endoscopic um, uh, testing. Um, as well as diagnostic imaging with MRI. Yeah, Nita. Yeah, no, I think Eric, you hit the knee. I think who is examining and do they pay attention? I think that's the set. The second question perhaps is similar now that, you know, if you're looking at breast and standardization, I still sense that even though colorectal cancer is one of our most common cancers, there remains a gap in standardized testing and you just showed us data of the 1% rule, right? The 1%, you know, the 3% HER2, the MSI, and how do we sort of work in national agencies in your role in starting to think about cancer and what should be the major things we test? I, I still think it's a wild west out there if we ignore some of the top institutions, you know, when you get to the rest of the country. I, I would say that from my experience thus far, I would say the majority of people do get tested for obviously RAS, that has been the most common thing, which, which obviously is extremely important. So then they can avoid anti-EGFR therapy. Um, there, I fully agree with you though. There are um, patients that still come to me that have never had BRAF testing, which obviously is extremely important. They've never had MSI testing. Um, and you know, I fully agree with you. I would just say that in every single lecture we give, every single um, bit of uh, publications that we can um, provide to individuals to educate others, we have to encourage um, that all patients need to be tested for molecular marker analysis. I mean, that is critical to their overall uh, treatment. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's so interesting when BRAF, um, so when Scott Kopetz originally um, talked about testing for BRAF, everybody thought he was crazy because, oh, it's such a rare patient population. Um, and how are we going to get people to do that? But it's really, as, as you know, it's a matter of education. And now it's, 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 for the majority of people, it is considered a standard of care. I would say a large number of people test for it now. Um, but HER2, it's still, it's still, you know, we're, we're trying to get there. Um, but HER2 is not commonly tested for. And Kathy, does that affect treatment for stage one and stage two disease? No. So, so I mean, you're, you're really talking about more advanced disease where testing is really correct. critical. Correct. Although obviously for MSI high, we would encourage it in all stages. Um, uh, yes, for largely metastatic disease, because we have not found the benefits of these other um, targeted agents in early stage disease. We've tried <laughs> with anti-EGFR therapy. We've tried with anti-VEGF therapy in stage three, um, which was, they were not successful studies. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question um, that, uh, you know, sort of a like big question about the future or the present, but if you had, could do anything um, and the goal is to reduce colon cancer deaths, in the United States and beyond, and you have two interventions to, that you could use, what would you do? Two interventions. Or two interventions or two, two air, you know, what are the unmet needs? So the two biggest unmet needs for colorectal cancer in 2022. I would say, well, the, the number one need still remains screening. I mean, in all fairness, we are still um, under screening in the United States. 
Um, it's still, I think it's like 78% is the best. Um, so, so many people are being missed um, and, and just because they don't want to be screened. Um, number two, oh, if I could do something um, and make it effective, I wish we could find some way to make IO therapy helpful <laughs> in the majority of our MSI stable colorectal cancer patients. Um, I, we appear to be at an, um, a standstill in regards to any potential combination thus far. Um, it, you know, it has, it's worked well in other malignancies, obviously upper GI, uh, HCC, uh, cholangio, and here we are still nowhere with it really in colorectal cancer, except the less than 5% with MSI high. But screening, I would rather prevent the colorectal cancer and not have to treat it. That would be my number one thing, which I know sounds odd coming as a medical oncologist. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, look, look, we all want to put ourselves out of work eventually. And to what extent um, do healthcare disparities play <laughs> into excess deaths in colorectal cancer? Um, so obviously, this is a this is an issue. Um, as you know, in our clinical trials, as like many other clinical trials, especially though in colorectal cancer. Um, the majority of patients that enroll in clinical trials are not um, our average patients. 95% are uh, uh, they're Caucasian or white, and the majority of patients do not participate in clinical trials. I wish I could. So if the number, if I could have, have a number three, yeah, I would get, get I would get more people to appreciate the importance of clinical trials. Yeah. and to help with enrollment and allow us to be able to provide the standard treatment arm in the community, you know, and, um, and that way will help with enrollment. Um, so that would be my number three thing. But in regards to uh, uh, diversity, we are lacking in clinical trials uh, completely. And a lot, large number of the, obviously, the data sets that exist. So I love Andrea Sursak. She's a friend of mine at Memorial, but she just published a big publication looking at uh, mutations at Memorial. It's one of the largest data sets, but yet 95% of her patients were white. And so it's not representative of the actual community. Nothing against her, it's the data she has, but that's the patient population that they have at Memorial. So no, no it's, it's a problem. So we have a, a question from Mary Kate Kelly. And that question is, does a low-fat diet or a vegetarian diet help decrease the chance of colorectal cancer? I would say definitely does not hurt. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, literature going back and forth regarding the diet. I think the majority of studies have shown, um, obviously, um, your uh, tendency to obesity is, is more of a concern. Um, there was also though, a very, very nice uh, publication just recently from my colleague here, Martha Shrepsall in epidemiology, uh, looking at um, polyphenols, I believe, um, uh, and the increased risk uh, actually in the uh, Black patient population, um, uh, which was published just recently. And a related question um, just came in, which is in patients who have had colorectal cancer, and they say to you, um, what can I do to prevent a recurrence? Are there any data that would support lifestyle interventions such as exercise, diet, any, any other sort of nutritional supplements, um, and finally, aspirin. Right. Um, so there is data regarding aspirin um, that appears to be more beneficial in the PIK3CA mutation patient, um, uh, which is about 15 to 20% of our patients, but a baby aspirin seems to be um, uh, fairly benign and potentially helpful. And then Jeff Meyerhart has published before on the role of um, exercise as well. Um, I would say all uh, good, healthy eating patterns and exercise obviously can't harm you. Um, and I would highly recommend them. Um, uh, and then there's been some, um, I would say those, that's the majority of the data. All right, well, um, and, um, and any data on vitamin D? That is an ongoing trial being led by um, uh, Kimmy Ng. Uh, I think it is called, I forgot the name of the trial, I apologize. Um, it is being run through the Alliance. And yeah. so they are looking at that. All right. Well, I think that, um, I think everyone got a tremendous amount out of this. Thank you so much for joining us, albeit from a distance. We, we look forward to having you here in person at some time. 
Um, and please, please give our best to all our friends at Vanderbilt. And um, we really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. It's been great. Thanks. Have a great day.